Stockholm Plus 50 will be an occasion to celebrate what has been achieved. But Stockholm Plus 50 will also be a time to reflect on the challenges and the opportunities that lie ahead. A few weeks ago, unveiling the Common Agenda, the UN Secretary General called on us to strengthen global governance. Indeed, addressing the triple planetary crisis calls for a united multilateral system that works together, not in silos. And it requires all voices to feed into a renewed social contract. Environmental protection includes addressing the extraterritorial effects of environmental degradation and sets uh, the frame for a, even a new economic thinking about the need to internalize environmental costs uh, of development. The main objective of the Stockholm Summit must be to defamiliarize ourselves with the existing principles and create new principles, a type of law for the Anthropocene. The assumption is, is that whatever new legal principles are developed for the Anthropocene, these principles must answer to one or more of the following three imperatives. One, they must be able to restrain geologically powerful humans, such as the principles of degrowth, decarbonization, or net zero emissions, even in dubio pro natura. Second, they must be congruent with the Earth system architecture and its governance challenges, such as the principles of interconnectivity and complexity. And third, they must inaugurate a new planetary ethic, such as principles of humility, planetary integrity, and planetary justice. And all of this translate into three categories of principles that we need to start to think urgently about. Behavioral principles, architectural principles, and ethical principles that are in fact appropriate for the Anthropocene. In our dominant system, we do use criminal law to draw the ethical lines. That is actually where we show our morals and our ethics, is by where we, say, where we draw the red line and where we say, no, this is not okay anymore. And, and, and at the same time, and that doesn't have to be a negative thing. We think, it, on the contrary, criminal law is ultimately protective law. Your right to life is protected by the crime of murder. Your right to a clean and healthy environment will be protected by a crime of ecocide. But the important thing is that unless you can see that coming and clearly see it coming, you can't make those adjustments. They talk about common heritage and, and common ownership. I believe in the, in legally get, getting actors to comply with the statements they're making and pledges they're making under the conventions. We need a higher level of um, a legal concept around the commons and who owns it. It's collectively owned. It, it's very difficult to attribute a portion of the commons to a country. It probably can be done with science. I'm not saying it can't be, but I think we need to move. We need that step change where science is really starting to drive um, implementation rather than just sort of be an advisory to a separate set of decisions being made under the conventions. Principles of international environmental law, they set normative trends. It means that these principles, they orientate the way how human activities and state activities have to be implemented in order to preserve the environment. And International courts and tribunals have actually recognized this trend-setting function of principles of international environmental law. One example that comes to my mind is the example of the award that was rendered by the famous Iron Rhine Tribunal in 2005 in a dispute between Belgium and the Netherlands, where the Iron Rhine Tribunal actually declared, and I quote, that today international law requires the integration of appropriate measures of environmental protection in the design and implementation of economic activities. And the tribunal deduced that trend from a principle of international environmental law. Principle four of the Rio Declaration, which as we know, reflect the principle of sustainable development. So the finding that this tribunal made about what international law is requiring today in terms of integrating appropriate measures of environmental protection in the design and implementation of economic activities came from a, from a trend. And the tribunal actually even used the word trend to say that principle four was reflecting a trend that would have, of course, to guide state and human activities. We need a step change 
in the role of science in dictating the common agenda. Um, right now, it's very much like advisory and it has to move if we are going to survive as a society, it's going to be very tough above 1.5 degrees Celsius in global average temperature rise. If we're going to survive, we, we need to have science have a more direct role. Environment is one whole. The planet is one. The environmental policy and uh, science is also integrated. What is climate from a legal standpoint? The concept to consider the planet from a legal standpoint, only as a territory divided between states where the global commons are only the territorial leftovers of this division is not able to explain the complexity and the functionality of their system. Climate is truly a global common in the natural world. We cannot divide it. We can divide airspace, we cannot divide climate. But because Climate is not a territory of good. We do not accept here that we have a, a global common that spans across borders and there is no borders. Humans treating everything else on the planet as something that is for their particular use and enjoyment or use as a resource um, rather than part of you know, a system that functions as a whole. Um, and you know, it's very difficult to make absolutely across the board um, decisions in, in terms of exactly how animals are treated in different places because things are very, very different across the world and in different countries around how farming is treated locally in different places and so on. But what we can almost always point to is that industrialized monocultural agricultural practices are very, very problematic in most cases. A stable climate is the way all matter circulates, moves around the planet. And this is mainly the outcome of the laws of thermodynamics. So when we are talking about a stable climate, we are talking about the pattern of stability of how energy and matter moves around the planet. This pattern is intangible. And law has many objects of law that are intangible and are on the base of the organization of our society. Every government owns its land, but who owns the ecosystem? This is, this is the question that hasn't yet been um, addressed and brought forward strongly in the convention. Uh, ecosystems don't care about country boundaries. Um, sometimes they correlate, but usually they cross over boundaries. And, um, you know, we're clear that a government should be able to do whatever it wants to with its land. But if a government does something with its land that harms another government, is that allowed? And um, we don't have agreement on this. This international framework should aim at establishing the legal status of the Earth system as a common uh, heritage of humanity. Conservation of the Earth system and the damage caused uh, on the world ecosystems uh, have to be considered uh, you know, somehow externalities to economic activity. And in this half a century, we have learned and we know clearly that um, it does not work like that. Climate change is also a common concern of humankind. This means that we are worried about something. The solution is we will try to make less emissions. And this is very interesting because we only talk about emissions. We do not talk about to end to explore oil, gas, or, or coal. We do not talk about the forests that are producing, providing the, the global public goods that is a stable climate. The solution was, let's keep the economic model as it is now, and we will try to produce less damage. This is what we have today. In the Paris Agreement, this is the center of climate policy that we have now. This is one of the main problems. Uh, you know, the market mechanisms to control CO2 emissions uh, basically uh, look at the already made emissions. So emissions have to be created first in order to recognize the value of removing them from the atmosphere. So in this sense, they follow the prevalent economic notion that wealth and well-being can only be 
uh, and exist through the alteration and damage of our ecosystem. So she, this cannot continue. We are reaching a point of no return. I think that the recognition of, of nature as a common uh, heritage of humanity has the potential to revert this development, uh, development paradigm. No amount of economic cost benefit analysis is going to help us. In other words, this is a problem that cannot be solved by economics. It can't even be addressed by economics. It's an existential threat. Uh, we need to treat it as such and not as an economic problem. We need new economies that, of course, deal with social issues of education, food, equality, and so on. That's important. We have a lot of work to do there. But we must recognize there is a ceiling. There is a limit to how much we can push the Earth system. And our big challenge is to meet these social requirements at the same time we stabilize the Earth system. That there's huge progress when it comes to the attention for young people, when it comes to their in integration in processes, in decision making. It's still based on invitations. Young people are invited. They're, it is not based on mandates. So we're still in a situation where, in that case, if we're debating such rights such for a safe environment or specifically for young people and future generations, at this stage, one of the most important things we need is we need a mandated space for young people at the table to discuss those things where they do not have to be scared that if they say something wrong or they are not pleasing to the negotiation, they're not invited again, but they, where they're included by mandate. We have to go all the way down to our core values, what we think is important in life. And I'll just read this to you. We're only here for a short amount of time to do what we've been put here to do, which is to look after country. We're only a tool in the cycle of things. We go out into the world and help keep the balance of nature. It's a big cycle of living with the land and then eventually going back to it. Notice that indigenous Australians understood cycles, systems, and balance. We've forgotten that in the Western world, in the globalized world. We need to look at our indigenous colleagues and say, we need to learn from you about the value systems that we need to take forward in the 21st century. I would like to invite everyone to focus and, and one of the high level uh, political outcome we can focus uh, should be the UNEP 50 next year uh, in, in March. The draft uh, declaration, which we of course invite your active contribution, I very much like the way you are collecting the, the inputs to your one page uh, declaration, where I already see the strong linkages and the merit with the, the political declaration, which has been also shared. So several areas uh, highlighted like right to a healthy environment is also recognized uh, in the political declarations. We need a founding text, very simple text, not technical. This kind of text, you know that you, could, you, could, you can put it on the wall in the classroom and with all the values. This kind, for example, with, we can imagine that the ecocide would be a part of the Global Pact for the Environment. I mean, with all the main values that a society share, because we need to come back to the value, to remember why we go together. What are our shared values? And that's why we proposed a Global Pact for the Environment. And I hope that one day we will have this kind of a founding text like the Magna Carta, like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We need that in the field of environment.